Hi, I'm Mary Pomerantz Dalbor from the Jewish Book Council, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's discussion. As always, we're so appreciative of you joining us here. This is the second in a series of events around the spring 2020 Natan Notable Books winner, The Seventh Heaven Travels Through Jewish Latin America by Ilan Stavans, and is being sponsored by Jewish Book Council, Natan Fund, and the Jewish Funders Network. Our mission at Jewish Book Council is to educate and enrich the community through Jewish literature. Visit jewishbookcouncil.org to learn about JBC's reviews, essays, literary journal paper brigade, our book club resources, author tours, and literary awards. A word of thanks to our panelists, Andres Bocoini and Ilan Stavans. We're looking forward to learning from you and to our audience. We hope you'll show your support by purchasing a copy of the books that are being linked in our chat. Um, thank you to our partners at Natan Fund and Jewish Funders Network. We encourage you to keep the chat open during the conversation for links and other information. Separately, if you and the audience have any questions, we'd love to hear them um, and you're more than welcome, but please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If we do not get to all of the questions today, the unanswered questions from this week and from last week's conversation as well will be collected and answered and available on the Jewish Book Council website. You'll receive information about that after the event. And now I'd like to introduce Adina Pupo, Associate Director of Natan Fund, who will tell you more about Natan Notable Books and about today's panelists. Great, thank you so much, Mary. I'm so glad to be here to introduce our excellent speakers today. Before I do so, let me just say a few words about Natan and the Natan Notable Book Award. Ilan Stavans' The Seventh Heaven is the spring 2020 Natan Notable Book, joining a growing list of distinguished works like Barry Weiss's How to Fight Anti-Semitism, Mati Friedman's Spies of No Country, Susie Linfield's In the Lion's Den, Jeremy Dauber's Jewish Comedy, A Serious History, and Ari Shabit's My Promised Land. Natan is a venture philanthropy fund and a giving circle. Our members invest their philanthropic dollars in cutting edge, emerging nonprofits um, around the world and in Israel and in and Jewish communities in North America as a way of engaging more people in Jewish life, helping Jewish communities to innovate and to adapt to new opportunities and challenges, and building a strong state of Israel and connecting people to it in authentic and meaningful ways. Usually we do this through giving to nonprofit organizations, but a few years ago we branched out into the world of written ideas by creating a book award in partnership with the Jewish Book Council. Twice a year, the Town Notable Books recognizes recently published or soon to be published nonfiction books that promise to catalyze conversations aligned with the themes of Natan's grant making. Professor Stavans' beautiful book brings the conversation of Jewish identity outside the borders of North America and Israel, introducing readers to Jewish immigrants, cultures, traditions, and communities across Latin America. Our goal is to catalyze conversations about the diversity of the Jewish people, especially at a time when diversity is very much part of public conversation, and to highlight the ever-evolving experiences of Jews in different parts of the world with their neighbors. Today's conversations will allow us to dive into one of the many themes of the book, anti-Semitism, a theme that Stevans will explore more comprehensively in his upcoming book, Hispanic Anti-Semitism. In conversation with JFN President and CEO Andre Spokoini, Professor Stevans will reflect on his experiences and discuss how the history and culture of the region distinguishes anti-Semitism there from prejudices and attitudes that surface here. When faced with anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, how have Latin American Jewish communities acted and reacted? I have no doubt that the conversation between Ilan and Andres will be illuminating. Let me introduce them to you briefly and then I will allow them to take it away. Ilan Stevans is the Louis Sebring Professor of Humanities, Latin American and Latino Culture at Amherst College, the publisher of Restless Books and the host of the NPR podcast In Contrast. His many books include the Oxford Book of Jewish, of Jewish Stories, the memoir On Borrowed Words, Spanglish, The Making of a New American Language, the three-volume set of Isaac Bashevis Singer, The Collected Stories, and many, many more. The recipient of numerous prizes whose work has been translated into 15 languages and adapted into film, TV, theater, and radio. Andres Spokoini is a longtime Jewish communal leader with a history of leading successful organizational transformation. He served as the CEO of Federation CJA in Montreal, and prior to that, Andres worked for the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee in Paris. As regional director for Northeast Europe, he's responsible for a number of pan-European projects. Before his Jewish communal work, Andres worked for IBM as responsible for training, developing, hiring, and recruiting for IBM's Latin American Southern region during a period of major restructuring. Originally from Argentina, Andres has a multidisciplinary academic background, including business education and rabbinical studies in different institutions around the world. I'll allow you to take it away. Thank you. 
uh, Adina, it's a real pleasure to be here and to share the, this, this panel with Ilan, whom, whose work I, I really admire. And lately we, we connected and we have a ton of things in common beyond uh, our accent. Uh, and and uh, I, I just want to say a, um, a big shout out to the Jewish Book Council that is an organization that has reinvented itself and grew enormously in the, in the last few years. Uh, Naomi and her team and her board, uh, you're just bringing Jewish, Jewish books to life in, in ways that are, that, are really, that are really cool. And of course, to Natan, who you know, is an organization that has uh, pioneered the, the technology of giving circles in the, uh, in the Jewish community. And uh, that work is now being replicated, but it's, it's important to know that it all started with Natan in the Jewish community. So to start, with with um, with a conversation here with Ilan, um, uh, first of all, be, before we go into the question of anti-Semitism in Latin America and in the Hispanic world, what can you tell about the the Jewish communities of Latin America because they are different than the than the U.S. Jewish community and they have a richness that. Uh, a lot of folks in this in in the north of the continent uh, not are not are not really familiar with. Hey, Andres, it's a pleasure to share the stage or the microphone or the screen uh, with you, and I am uh, very grateful grateful and humbled by uh, this prize and by the enterprise to uh, to broaden the discussion on uh, major topics, including antisemitism. Uh, beyond Israel and the United States, in this case, to Latin America. As you said it, uh, uh, the Latin American Jewish community is, uh, is unique, is diverse and heterogeneous. There are uh, 20 different countries. Uh, in each of these countries has its own uh, approach to Jewish life. Uh, it has its own history, it has its own uh, metabolism and idiosyncrasy. Uh, the fact that we call all all of them together, Latin America, is, is uh, both a way of uh, uh, summarizing uh, the diversity in, of the experiences and also erasing that, uh, that those nuances. And I think it's important to put it in comparison, say, with Europe uh, or with the Arab world or with Asia, uh, when we think about European anti-Semitism, as, as we're going to be talking about today, it, it is a very different type when we talk about German antisemitism vis-a-vis -vis French or Italian or uh, British or Spanish. Uh, Latin America has a population of, a Jewish population of roughly half a million Jews. Uh, the numbers fluctuate uh, and it depends on the demographics that you are looking at. It could be a little higher and a little lower. Assimilation patterns are important also. Um, if the main center of Jewish life is Argentina, the country you come from, uh, that has been a magnet for immigrants, uh, Ashkenazi, from uh, roughly 1817, 1880 to the present. Um, two out of three Jews in Latin America live in Argentina, uh, in La Plata, in Buenos Aires. Uh, the community, Ashkenazi again, started it mostly as agricultural with the uh, settlements in the Pampas sponsored by the, uh, the Baron Maurice de Hirsch, by the Alianza Israelita Universal, and as in other parts of the world, it moved from the agricultural to the city. Uh, most Argentine Jews today live in urban centers. Uh, Brazil is the second largest concentration with roughly 160 to 180,000 Jews. Argentina has probably between 240 to 260. Uh, Portuguese makes Brazil, uh, the largest country of Latin America, makes Brazil both an island, because it's very different to the rest, uh, and a power on its own. Uh, I think it's important to remember that uh, the history of Brazil is very different with the Portuguese empire than the history of the Spanish empire in the Spanish speaking parts of Latin America. And then in distant third comes Mexico, comes Colombia, it comes uh, Peru, Chile, depending on the country, 
the size of the population can be 40,000 Jews roughly in Mexico, it could be 20,000 Jews, etc. Many, and I finish with this, many uh, Jews that live in Latin America trace their ancestry to three lines. Uh, the Ashkenazi is the largest in terms of numbers. Yiddish speakers who came from the Pale of Settlement, uh, more or less at the same time that came to the United States, uh, to Argentina, to Brazil, to Chile, to Mexico. Um, and that arrival more or less ended in the 1930s uh, with the Second World War. Prior to it, there were the Sephardic Jews or the Jews from Spain. And those Jews came with Spanish or with Ladino. Many of them came as crypto Jews, secret Jews, Marranos, and Nusim, uh, depending on how one perceives them. And by the time the arrival, uh, by the time the, the Yiddish speaking Jews came at the end of the 19th century, uh, many of them didn't know that there had been a prior chapter in Jewish history in Latin America, the one of, that had to do with the Spanish Inquisition and had to do with, the, with 1492 and the expulsion. There is a third line or, or path, and that is the Mizrahi Jews that have come with the Ottoman Empire from Syria, from Lebanon, from Egypt, from Turkey, from the, for, from the Balkans, the former Yugoslavia, Greek Jews, that uh, many of them, uh, the, the Mizrahim spoke Latino, spoke French, spoke Arabic, um, and the three Jewish communities uh, coexist interact with each other, depending on the country. They are closer together. Uh, there are rivalries between these communities. When I was growing up in Mexico, uh, I remember my, the elders saying that it was better to marry a shiksa than to marry a shahata, meaning somebody coming from the Mizrahi or the Sephardic side, uh, foolish as it might sound today. Um, but it is important to localize the history of Jews in Latin America and to not blanket it as all Latin American Jews are the same, they all belong to the same class, they are the same color skin, they speak the same language. It's a variety, it's a multiplicity, it's an extraordinary mosaic of, of opportunities and chances that in diverse paths. And for that reason, I think it des de deserves to be studied and understood uh, with nuance, with, with detail. So, so it's it's different in its constitution, and the communities are different, but then anti-Semitism is different than the one we can uh, experience in the United States. You mentioned yeah. the crypto Jews and the Marranos, and there is a rich tradition there of, of anti-Jewish sentiment, right? Can you yes. talk about what makes Latin American anti-Semitism unique? I think that uh, the topic of antisemitism, the category, the, the concept of antisemitism, again, is too broad, too, too uh, expansive. Uh, there is not one type of antisemitism anywhere in the world. Antisemitism, just like politics, is always local. Arab antisemitism responds to very particular factors on the ground. Uh, the existence of the state of Israel, a certain tradition that is different from French antisemitism or from German antisemitism. Latin American antisemitism is part of, of Hispanic antisemitism, and it's, it has its own, uh, it, it, its own view of life. I would define it as having three characteristics, Andres, and I think coming from Argentina, as you do, you will, you will, you will, I think, agree with me, maybe you will also have a, a different interpretation. There is, first of all, the, the antisemitism that is rooted in the Catholic Church, in the Spanish Inquisition. It, it is theological in nature, and it connects Jews with the, the story of Christ. It condemns them for having betrayed the new Messiah, and the, institutionally, the Spanish Inquisition, there were inquisitions in uh, most countries in Europe, and most countries in Europe also expelled the Jews. Uh, by the time Shakespeare was writing The Merchant of Venice, uh, there were no Jews left, or hardly any Jews left in England. They had been expelled almost 200 years before. And so his exposure to Jewish types in archetypes and prototypes was based on hearsay, was based on Marlowe and other things that he had read. Um, 
in, in the history of the Inquisition in general, the Spanish Inquisition plays a major role. It is the one that was closely linked to the state and it created a whole set of effects that have to do with secret life, with hiding, with the not announcing publicly the, that you're Jewish or that you're Muslim. I think that that is a, a, a defining factor in Jewish life in Latin America. The, the, the border between what is public and what is private, the domestic and the collective. In crypto Jews in, in Marranos had to keep the Jewish identity hidden because of the Inquisition. There were autos de fe in Peru, in, in Lima, in Mexico City that, uh, that shaped the, the whole debate on purity of blood and on who was accepted and who was rejected from the civil society. That antisemitism is still present in Latin America, sponsored by the church, although it has lessened, lessens, lessened its, uh, its presence, its, its value. Uh, there is a second type of antisemitism that is more economic in, in, in nature. It, uh, it begins in Europe at the end of the 19th century. It probably has its apex or its climax with the protocols of the wise or of the elders of Zion, a book written in Russia at the beginning of the 20th century that quickly gets translated to many countries and in Latin America remains a very popular book. You can, you buy, can, you can buy it in the, in the subway station in Buenos yes. Aires. Newsstands in Mexico City. It has been adapted into graphic novels and, and it's, its hideous uh, power remains quite present. And the suggestion is of this type of antisemitism, not based on theology, on religion, it is based on economics. Jews are part of a cabal that, are that is controlling the media, that is controlling politics, that is controlling commerce. And the, in Latin America, the, the, the notion that the immigrants that arrived are infiltrating the governments and taking everything for themselves is, is very noxious and still very, very powerful. The third so, type of antisemitism, just to conclude here, yeah. is the one that erases the border between antisemitism and anti-Israel or anti-Zionism. And it is really, it comes to the fore after the Yom Kippur War, more so in 1982 with the invasion of Lebanon. And it is, it comes from the left, rather from that from the church or from conservative movements. Uh, and it is, uh, it is connected with the Palestinian plight. And uh, it, it means that progressive causes on the left can have very strong anti-Semitic views in universities, in, in, the, in the arts, in the humanities, and that there's also the anti-Semitism that comes from the a capital, capitalist view of things and Jews being seen as suspicious. So it's, there's a lot to unpack here because each of these trends in anti-Semitism has its own thing. But just, just one thing that is important to say, and, and we, when we were preparing for, for, for this call, Eden and I reflected on the fact that the foundational ethos of most Latin American countries are actually very liberal. I mean, liberal in the traditional sense, right? Like uh, San Martin, the liberator of, of, uh, of Peru and uh, Argentina and Chile, basically the first thing he does when, he, when we liberate Lima from the Spanish is he burns all the torture instruments of the uh, Inquisition. So there, there, is, there seems to be sort of these two things, sort of the foundational ethos that is very open, very liberal, uh, people you know, fleeing persecution and what have you. And then there is that, that other counter trend of, of sort of you know, xenophobic feeling that could take different forms, correct? Absolutely. And I think that that is, it really, really it explains the dialectic that exists in Latin America. I, I would add to that, Andres, the fact that Latin America doesn't have the myth of the American dream. There is less mobility uh, for minorities than there is in the United States. In the United States, the journey of the Jewish immigrant is one from the periphery to the center. It's a success story. Jewish culture is American culture and vice versa. In Latin America, there has been an ascendance of the Jewish minority in terms of education, in terms of the, um, 
uh, finances and culture, but in many countries, less so in Argentina and Brazil than in others, Jews remained a small minority, mostly to themselves. Uh, the interaction is a, on a daily basis, but culturally can be separated. There's a, there are sports centers, there are cultural places where Jews will keep on going, there are private schools. I think that's another important element. And I think that one should also, with this liberal view that Latin America has always had and that many countries have made a, a separation between the state and the church or the state and religion, there is also the fact that uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, Latin America, while remaining Catholic, has really expanded its religious uh, infrastructure. There is a growing Protestant movement, a Buddhist movement, the presence in Latin America, Chile in particular, mm. as the largest concentration of Palestinians. Yeah. Christians and Muslims uh, outside of the Middle East and Islam is a growing faith in the region. So whereas at the time of the Inquisition or in the 19th century, we could only think of the monolith of, of Christianity and Catholicism in particular as the one defining Latin America, today being Jewish is part of a larger menu of possibilities that I, I think is very important to keep in mind. That's, that's very interesting. You, you mentioned the impact of, of the protocols and conspiracy theories and this, you know, we, un, unfortunately, we, we seem to live to be living now in the golden age of conspiracy theories, like anything from QAnon to you name it. But I remember when I was growing up in uh, Argentina, there was this particularly bizarre conspiracy theory that claimed that Jews wanted to conquer the Patagonia and make it into a Jewish state. And, and, that, and that sort of takes the protocols and sort of adapts it to the local context. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, and I, I, I am very grateful that you're bringing it uh, to the conversation because I don't think uh, Americans, American Jews in particular, know enough about uh, the Plan Andinia, as it is called. It is a, a, a myth that is uh, well spread in Chile and Argentina, uh, particularly in the southern parts, in the Patagonia. The argument more, goes more or less like this. Uh, Israel is tired of its uh, ongoing relationship with the Arab world in general, with the Palestinians in particular. The choice of uh, Palestine, uh, the, the Middle East, uh, which was one of three uh, in the Zionist Congresses um, that Herzl and others were uh, orchestrated, was the wrong one. There were other two. One was Uganda and the other one was Argentina and that maybe the Jewish state should be, the, the Israelis are thinking that maybe the Jewish state should be relocated to southern Chile, southern Argentina, in the Patagonia, and they are quietly buying land and a real estate in order to relocate. It, it is a hideous plan. It's, a, it's part of this a, a paranoid mentality that the Jews are taking over. I was, for the book, traveling through Patagonia, and there are, I have photographs and countless interviews of places where Israelis are not allowed in a restaurant. There are signs on the wall about, on walls, on what the Planandinia is about. It is at the, at the folklore level. It is at the level of rumors and innuendos. But we know very well, all of us, that uh, anti-Semitism works at the level of rumors and innuendos. And this slowly infiltrates society from, from underneath until it reaches higher levels. And in certain, um, certain mayors, certain political figures, on occasionally will expound some of these ideas about the Plan Andinia that uh, I would not be surprised might acquire more, more presence, more echoes in decades to come. Right, and, and, and as it happens in the US, you know, through social media, these fringe theories can become widespread very, very fast and, and, and you know, become sort of much more, much, much more widespread. Um, but, but just fast forward um, from the Plan Andini and the protocols to modern, you know, contemporary progressive 
so-called progressive anti-Semitism. Um, there is an ethos in Argentina of the guerrilla fighter, you know, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. And, I mean, in, in all of Latin America. Um, does that bring a little bit of quote-unquote sympathy for the Palestinian cause? Um, is, is it sort of a connection of this sort of Latin American freedom fighter with, with, with the Palestinians? Uh, it's very important to study the, the Palestinian-Israeli issue from the perspective of Latin America as well. And I, as a scholar, cannot uh, be more forceful or persuasive, hopefully, in encouraging young, young researchers to look at this earnestly. Uh, Latin America became a safe haven for Jews, the, the way that I was explaining to you, these three immigrant groups. Uh, with, after 1948, it also became progressively a, a safe haven for Palestinians. And there are a number of places, you mentioned Chile, Argentina is another one, a, a Uruguay, where the Palestinian population and the Jewish population coexist with one another. They are a, next to each other all the time. And uh, the dialogue the two of them uh, establish is sometimes tense. Um, in the book, I, I interview a number of people who say that when there is a war in Israel, the, the dialogue ceases for a year, two years. Then slowly the younger generation tries to reestablish it. Many of the Palestinians that live in Latin America are uh, Christians, not, not Muslims. So that also defines the, the approach. Um, Many, the, many countries have had sympathy for the socialist communist model. Uh, Cuba, of course, was one of them. But in the question that you're asking me, uh, I think the important one here is Venezuela. Hugo Chavez, uh, the architect of the Bolivarian Revolution in Venezuela, that uh, unfortunately is still very uh, present today. I say unfortunately because although it might have a good a, a goals, it has bankrupt the country, and it has been very dangerous to the Jewish community, has used the Jews of Caracas as a scapegoat, as a target to criticize Israel. It has sent or sponsored a hooligans that have entered various synagogues and they desecrated them, destroyed the Aaron Kodesh, they painted swastikas, I was there on a couple of occasions interviewing various, in the, various members of the Jewish community immediately after some of these desecrations. Cemeteries have been desecrated as well. In, and that has been sponsored by a Chavista regime that sees Israel as an imperial colonialist power that is uh, oppressing the Palestinians and that Latin American countries need to present themselves as saviors, as, as proponents of, the, of, of endorsing the Palestinians, erasing every nuance, every complication, looking at things as if they were simply black and white. Um, it is also important to mention that, it, that the presence of Israel in Latin America is in itself complex. There, as, there has been a, an astonishing amount of Latin American Jews that have made Aliyah, that lived in kibbutzim in different there are kibbutzim in Israel that, that are the Argentine kibbutz or the Brazilian kibbutz, uh, soccer teams that are more connected with the Argentinian Jews that immigrated than the Brazilian. And the Argentinian Jews win at soccer. I just want to, it's important to, to stress that. Like, we don't, Mexicans don't have enough support for this. <laughs> I can't really comment. But, uh, you know, there have also been moments in, a, in the history of Latin America where dictators like Pinochet, uh, Fidel Castro, Chavez, have been either close to the Jewish community or distant from the Jewish community. And that has had an impact on how dictatorships on both ideological sides, the left and the right, have uh, behaved toward the Jews. Pinochet was actually very close to the Jewish community. Hugo Chavez, very far and very aggressive. Fidel Castro collaborated with the, with the, silently, not publicly, with various entities of the Israeli government and of the Israeli army and with the Mossad. Uh, I interviewed uh, Israelis that lived or live to this day uh, in Havana and, and, and speak to that. So it's important to think that even when there is a, a leader that is a strong man uh, and, and has the 
a profile of a tyrant or a dictator, the, the relationship with the Jews in itself will be complicated. And that's another yeah. chapter of anti-Semitism in Latin America. But it, you know, it's, 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 it's fascinating that in a way, um, some of the dictators in Latin America uh, pre-announced something that we see today in some countries, which is that you can be strongly pro-Israel uh, and, and fervently anti-Semitic. Like in, uh, during my youth, I remember like the, the, the military government was very anti-Semitic, yeah. but it has very, very close relations with uh, Israel. There was trade, there were, they were voting in favor of Israel in the UN and what have you. And, and we're seeing that now with Viktor Orban in Hungary and, and, yeah. and Duterte in the Filipinas. Sort of, you can be like, you, you can have this split personality between the two. It's a very, it's, 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 that is what I am, I am hoping that uh, the seventh heaven will provoke or will encourage. And there is the sense that um, we need to go beyond easy categories, easy perceptions. There is one fascinating moment in a memoir written by Jacobo Timerman, probably the most important uh, journalist, a Jewish journalist in Latin America. And this book is a, is a, is a canonical text to understand a free press, to understand the plight of the Jews. It's called a prisoner without a name, so without a number, in, in where he is, in, he's imprisoned, and he's he, the, the 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 police, the the figures that are inside the prison talk to him a, about all his activities as a journalist, but then tell him that they believe that Hitler didn't, didn't complete the job and that the job needs to be completed now in Argentina by capturing him and others and destroying parts of the Jewish community. It's fascinating to think that even um, uh, Timmerman himself will later on be allowed to leave the jail, move to Israel, and he will become himself very critical of Israel write a book about Lebanon and, and have a complicated relationship. It is, it's, a, it's that duality of do you support the Jewish community and uh, antagonize Israel or do you support Israel but antagonize the Jewish community is something that permeates the life of Latin American Jews often perceived as a kind of envoys of Israel in whatever political position they have toward Netanyahu or toward any other government, just because they are Jews, they are going to be perceived as extremities of what Israel is doing in the region. And uh, maybe all this comes to a, to a climax uh, with the biggest event uh, that anti-Semitism in Latin America uh, has produced, uh, and that is in 1994, the terrorist attack against the AMIA, the Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires, Iran sponsored it. At that time, Saul Menem of Lebanese descent was president of Argentina. To this day, people have not been brought to justice. It is a muddy case that has brought down many politicians. And it's a, it's a moment, I think, Andres, when we can say that Latin American Jews became part of the Middle East, became contemporaries of other communities and no longer distant in this region that nobody knew anything about. Uh, terrorists could take revenge against Israel by using the vulnerability of these small communities. Right, and it's like, it's like what was happening in Europe in the 70s and 80s with people transplanting the Middle East conflict into Europe and we exactly. saw Shurikin and what have you, moved into to Latin America in a very forceful way. Um, but you, you mentioned the AMIA bombing, and you know there there are moments in history that sort of become sort of the the the, the critical events in the history of anti-Semitism. Like in the U.S., you can talk about you know General Grant's Resolution Number Eleven, you know Order General Number uh, Eleven, expelling the Jews, the Leo Frank case, you know lately, unfortunately, the Pittsburgh shooting. Right. What are the what are the the the, the foundational events in in anti-Semitism in Latin America. You mentioned yeah. one, the AMIA bombing, yeah. but th yeah. there were others that preceded them, right? Yeah. I would mention, uh, because of the brevity of time that we have, yeah. I, would, I would mention four, Andres. The first one 
Uh, and I'm not counting the 1492, the expulsion. I'm talking about Latin America as, as we know it today. Uh, there are autos de fe that take place at the end of the 15th century that are very important. Uh, Luis de Carvajal, the younger, is uh, uh, burned at the stake. But I'm talking about modern Latin America. Yeah. And I think the first one is uh, the so-called Semana Tragica or Tragic Week in 1919, the only pogrom-like events we have had in the entire continent, where for, because of a series of anarchist and communist uh, strikes and uh, marches, the Argentinian army was sent in and a large number of Jews and Jewish businesses were targeted. They were seen as immigrants, they were seen as communist and anarchist sponsored it is a tragic moment. It is called the tragic week. And I think it defined the way Jewish immigration was going to be seen forever. A very important uh, intellectual at the time, Alberto Gertunov, the author of the Jewish Gauchos, uh, was, was in love with Argentina. He thought Argentina was el país de advenimiento, the next promised land. And after the Semana Tragica, he realized that Argentina was not going to be that promised land. And he became a Zionist in a much more forceful way. The, the second one that I would include is the 1939 boat, uh, the St. Louis, the German boat uh, ship that docked in Havana Harbor um, with 900 plus Jews from uh, escaping Europe. And uh, because of corruption and because of political uh, stalemates, it, neither the Cubans nor the Americans opened the doors to them. Many of the C Canadians either, and eventually many were them were sent back and died in concentration camps. It was a watershed moment of what Latin America could or didn't do for the refugees, uh, the, the, the people escaping Europe at that time. In 1960-61, the Eichmann uh, capture by the Mossad in Buenos Aires it is seen as a moment of triumph for the young Jewish state and for Jews after the Holocaust, and it certainly is. But in Latin America, it has very deep and long lasting effects. It, many Argentines and many Argentine Jews saw this as a, an infringement on sovereignty, so, sovereignty by the Israelis, and anti Semitism really deteriorated after the, the Eichmann. Case, I think that uh, we think of Eichmann in Jerusalem, we think of Eichmann in Germany, we should think of Eichmann in Buenos Aires. And in the effect, just to tell you very quickly, there was, uh, such was the anti-Semitism that uh, resulted uh, from the kidnapping of Eichmann that the Jewish community uh, silently also with, a, with Israeli support organized itself in a kind of paramilitary army that uh, sought to defend the property and the interest of the Jewish community, that approach was also replicated in other countries like Uruguay, like Brazil, like Mexico. I was a member of Bitajon, a group that was uh, designed to help the, uh, in terms of, of, of physical help, the Jewish life, because we knew the police would not help us, the, go the government would not help us. And then the last one, Andres, is the AMIA, that terrorist attack that killed uh, almost uh, 90 people, 85 people, and left many, many uh, uh, injured. And, uh, and it was a devastating moment for Jewish memory because YIVO and other uh, important archives were in, this, in that uh, building, yeah. and uh, all that was destroyed, or most of it. I remember, I remember going there and sifting through the through the through the rubble to try to find some of the Evo books and thanks God, uh, forty thousand documents of Evo were were actually rescued from the from the rubble. And but the Amia bombing was also par particularly painful because it did, and it actually changed the game in terms of Israel and and the Arab terrorism because there had been a bombing of the Israeli embassy before. Two years before, yeah. But, but somehow the bombing of the embassy was considered, and it's terrible to say this way, but it was considered within the rules of the game. Like right. Israel attacks Hezbollah, Hezbollah attacks an Israeli target. 
But the, the, the AMIA was kind of the first time in Latin America that Hezbollah, who's suspected to be quite, quite you know, clear that is the, the, the culprit, decided to target the Jewish community in retribution for something that Israel supposedly did. And that, and that I think, is, you know, goes to the, to the shock that you, that you mentioned. I think the effect of that is, uh, is as I mentioned, long-standing, Andres. Um, many Jewish communities, many temples, uh, many uh, sports and cultural centers in Latin America realized that they needed to act from that moment on. Uh, today, if you're a foreigner, many of the, of the people who are listening to us will, and who have tried to go to, to say, Minion uh, or to service in, in Santiago or in Bogota, will know that it's no longer, those places are no longer open. They are, there's heavy security. You have to send a petition weeks in advance. Uh, there's, there's a, I have interviewed many Latin American rabbis and uh, being with them means uh, having to pass a series of steps of, uh, yeah. of security, walking with them with two or three bodyguards uh, on the street. It's a sad story because I grew up in Mexico with the, the doors of shul open to anybody. Same with me. Anyway. Same with me. We would we would never imagine having an armed guard yeah. at a shul. Anybody could walk in, and 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 the the guard was a doorman who was sort of a you know a friend, and you just greeted him and walked in. And and for that reason, to me, Andres, when I see something like Pittsburgh, somebody entering. I see it as a Latin American Jew living in the United States. I see the vulnerability that we have experienced. I see the debate of, a, of, of needing to defend ourselves in a way that uh, sometimes uh, there's no other option. Uh, I know that this is a very controversial issue. American Jews, we see ourselves, and I play here with two voices, the voice of being a Latin American, the voice of being an American. We want to be part of a free, free a pluralistic, democratic, open, liberal society. Uh, we might be coming to a time in this, particularly under this uh, president, where th such things are vanishing very quickly, right. uh, evaporating like, like into thin air. And the very concept that exists in the United States of a free entrance to a shul, of a free debate and dialogue with others, might become part of the past, and I say this with a heavy heart, as a citizen from Latin America that has seen it firsthand, um, and it's a form of protection. It's a form of, sur of survival. Hi, we we have um, we have uh, a lot of questions from the audience, and I would like, I have a lot of questions myself, but I I want to give I want to give voice to some of the questions from the from the audience here, um, and. Uh, I apologize in advance that there are really a lot, so I won't be able to get through all of them. Uh, but uh, you're welcome us to, to, to send them to us by email and we'll do the best we can to, to answer them. Um, there's, there's an interesting question here about the influence of German uh, emigres after World War II, many of them with a Nazi past. Do you think that has impacted the landscape of anti-Semitism in Latin America? Yes, I think it's a, it's, I'm, I'm very grateful for the question. Um, Latin America is a, obviously also the stage for the so-called rat route, the, the often a Vatican sponsored, but it was sponsored by other entities as well, a, a line of former Nazis who were hiding their identities and made it to various countries of Latin America, the most prominent one are Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, Bolivia, uh, but there were others in other countries as well, including Mexico. Um, it is important to see this rat route, and the major names are Mengel, Joseph Mengele, uh, and also the Eichmann, but there were many others, and the, 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 the support that they received was in, in considerable part uh, coming from immigrants to those countries that had arrived concurrent with Yiddish speaking Jews at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. Many of them had also started agriculturally in rural areas and slowly moved to the cities. 
um, there are very famous cases of still to this day, German speaking communities in Chile, in Argentina, that uh, many of them do not necessarily have to have this vision of supporting Nazism or supporting the, 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 the right, uh, like other immigrants, they have gone through all sorts of uh, uh, reckonings and explorations, but uh, the, the infrastructure that happened for somebody like Ricardo Clement, the pseudonym that uh, Eichmann used when being in, in Buenos Aires had in large part to do with the German community that was already stationed there that created false passports that gave him uh, jobs in, in the automobile industry and so on. It, it would be a mistake to again blanket all German immigrants as having a particular vision. Because I, I remember that, that there is a, a strong anti-Nazi German community, Absolutely. especially exactly. in Mexico and in, and in Buenos Aires, people that escaped Germany in the 30s because of Nazism. And actually, there are very distinct yeah. German organizations Absolutely. in Latin yeah. America of the pre-Nazis and post-Nazi. And the uh, post-Nazis. And, and I, I think it's, it's a very important element because Latin America has been, a, we consider it always again, monolithic, but it has been a safe haven for many immigrants. Peru has had many Japanese uh, immigrants, uh, you know, to the point that one of them became eventually uh, Fujimori, the president of the country. Uh, Germans were an important immigration to this region. And they, it, it, you know, in the lore of Jewish Latin America, there's always the survivor from Auschwitz or another concentration camp and the former Nazi living in the same neighborhood a crossing paths, sometimes having coffee uh, together, or at least in tables next to each other. And there are a number of Latin American novels and movies that have used this as a theme to explore the, 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 the connection between the two. So there is, there's a couple of questions here, and, and, and also something that I wanted to ask you. Uh, you know, people that engaged with, with work in, in Latin America around you know, work of memory and what have you, they say they haven't experienced anti-Semitism. And actually, most Latin American Jews, they, they don't think that they experience anti-Semitism as a hindrance to their daily life. They're successful, they're integrated. You know, in most Latin American countries, you had Jewish ministers and people in government. So uh, uh, is it, uh, uh, at the same time, there's a, there's a higher level of prejudice, I would say. And is the question that, people are simply not politically correct in how they voice certain prejudices about Jews um, that are truly anti-Semitic in the sense that they think that Jews shouldn't, shouldn't belong or shouldn't exist. And... Yeah, you know, I, I think that we've entered a, a discussion in the United States with ra racism that it might be useful to, to, to certain elements. When we talk about microaggressions, for instance, uh, the young people particularly talk about microaggressions, they talk about certain uh, looks or, or certain uh, twists of a sentence that uh, people might not be aware of, but have a heavy dose of racism or anti-minority or anti-color um, uh, uh, sentiment. Latin America has an, a, a sediment of anti-Semitism that is widespread. It doesn't manifest itself all the time in, in, in the sense that uh, people have to hide in houses or have to uh, have a weapon at home. Uh, there are archetypes and stereotypes that are promoted on television and on radio. There is also an ongoing liberal view of counterattacking all this all the time. Uh, it is a region where uh, the study of antisemitism has not been done deep enough by itself in order to understand whatever the microaggressions or, or those other elements might be. Um, but I, in, in, in being a Latin American Jew, I know exactly what this question, the, the question, what this question is about. I grew up in Mexico. I love Mexico. I feel Mexico. I feel Mexican, and I am in debt to Mexico. I, I, at the same time. You know, going to college in Mexico, my, my friends would ask me questions about um, having my ancestors kill Jesus at one point, out of ignorance, but anti-Semitism grows up from ignorance. Right. Uh, my father, who, is, who was a prominent actor in Mexico, at one point was in a play 
uh, in the 1970s uh, that had an anti-clerical tone. And there were members of, uh, of the Opus Dei, of, the, of the, an extreme right group that jumped into the stage with chains in, in bats and hit the actors and sent them to hospitals, fracturing skulls and bones, uh, my father among them. So there are moments of explosion that take place as in any, in any other form of antisemitism. But I would also say that uh, in their heart, Latin Americans are loving, embracing, passionate people, people eager to learn, eager to understand, not easily fooled, and that the move away from religion has encouraged many to understand the roots of all this in ways that are hopeful, I think the Jewish communities in Latin America don't have the infrastructure to study and to counterattack many of these things the way it should, and they might need help from the United States and from Israel and from Europe. Yeah, and, and to that, I mean, there's, there's a question here about, and I think it's the last one we will be able to ask, uh, because I want to ask you about your new book too, uh, before, we, before we close. Um, somebody's asking about how effective are the local communities in fighting anti-Semitism? What strategies are they using? Are they being effective? You know, yeah. you know it, again, it's 20 countries with 20 different uh, paradigms. Uh, when you are a 0.0001% of the population, your resources and your capacity to counteract is very different to when you, to when you are a, a 2% of the population or 0.1% of the population. Uh, many of these communities uh, prefer for survivalist reasons to keep a low profile. When there is an act of antisemitism, they would rather handle it uh, in ways that don't bring forth more public debate. And uh, one can have all sorts of approaches to this, but it might also be the right approach when you are more vulnerable. Uh, others like the Argentinians, uh, like the Argentines and the Brazilians have more resources, uh, can learn more from others. So I, I think that it's important to keep in mind that a lot that is done to counter antisemitism is not, in Latin America, is not done in the public eye. It is done through education, through museums, and, and with the talking to the ministers of ministries of education and, in, in culture to see if the Diary of Anne Frank, a book by Elie Wiesel, a Schindler's List can be watched by people. The majority of people of Latin America have no sense of the Holocaust, the way Americans have a sense of the Holocaust. And here we complain that the young generation has less and less. I'm very worried about the, the disinterest in antisemitism in the young American generation. So it's, it's done kind of in the quiet side of so to, to, um, to close, can you, can you tell us a few words about your new book? And uh, first of all, who, whoever hasn't read Seventh Heaven, it's a beautiful book. It's both personal and conceptual and, and it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a work of love. So I, I really uh, uh, suggest everybody to, to read it. Um, but tell us a little bit about the new book who focuses specifically on anti-Semitism. Yeah, it's also, uh, I thank you for this question. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. It's, it's a pleasure and an honor to, to, to be in this conversation with you. It, it, is a, it is a book where I want to focus now on this topic of antisemitism. It is, it's going to be short. I'm almost finished with it. It, it highlights both the outside forces that have come in in Latin America and the inside forces, and it encourages people to look at, an, at, at Hispanic anti-Semitism with its unique on the ground characteristics that distinguish it from others. Um, it will, as, as, it of, as is often in my work, mix the anecdotal elements of interviews and conversations with the historical and the sociological. And I am hoping that it will now that the Latino community is growing and uh, having more political, economic power, I'm hoping that because it is in English, it will invite a larger uh, approach to understanding what antisemitism in Latin America is and how we should consider it seriously. 
which is which is a huge topic that we haven't touched on, but it's really we should, which is how the dynamics of Latin America uh, affect the Latino population in the U.S. that comes into the U.S. with all that baggage, positive and negative, about, right. about Jews and Israel and the like. But unfortunately, we don't have time to do that now. It's going to be for the next one. And I'm going to give the floor back to uh, Miri to, to, to close the session and send us off with, again, big, big thanks to Ilan, to Nathan, and to the Jewish Book Council for their amazing work. And then just thank you so much to you for your time and energy um, in having this conversation to Elon, both of you for your time, your expertise, and for sharing your personal experiences. The conversation was fascinating. And we can tell from the question list that our audience was really interested as well. As I mentioned earlier, the questions that we didn't get to today will be answered along with those from last week's. Um, you'll receive more information about where to find those. And we hope you'll join us for our final conversation with Dr. Stevan later this fall as he talks about Jewish Latin American food and culture um, alongside Jewish Food Society and Mexican chef, TV personality, cookbook author. You can find the link um, to that in our chat today um, and on the Facebook page. Thank you all for sharing in this important conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Bye-bye. Shabbat shalom.